So thank you so much, Molly, for mm -hmm. talking to my students. We have students from Drawing 2, Advanced Studio, and 2D Design. And so I'm also happy that some of my students can um, maybe see or at least hear each other uh, and be in the same Zoom meeting together. And then a few of my Drawing 1 students were able to join. I wanted to extend the invitation to them as well in case they were able since um, this is a really special event. So we're really happy and honored that you could talk with, with all of us. Um, so I did send Molly's website, but I wanted to also introduce her in case you didn't have time to look or didn't read her bio. Um, but Molly, Molly Springfield makes graphite drawings uh, that use photocopies of printed text as their source material. So she'll be talking about her process, but just so you know right away um, what you're looking at, uh, at least a little, little tidbit there. Um, she's had 14 national and international solo exhibitions. So this is really significant because um, it's great to be in exhibitions, but when you put together a solo exhibition, it's a whole nother feat. Um, it often takes a year or longer to create the body of work and it's all your work. So that's, it's all eyes are on you. Um, and I apologize, I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, my internet connection is sometimes unstable, um, but I, I'm just doing the best I can. <laughs> so just bear with me if that happens. Um, her solo exhibitions include shows in New York, Washington, DC, San Francisco, Chicago, and Germany. Um, her museum exhibitions include the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Berkeley Art Museum, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Arts at Harvard University, the Drawing Center, which is in New York City, Indianapolis Museum of Art, and Portland Museum of Art. Her work is included in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She has received her MFA from the University of California and has residencies in the Skowhegan School of Painting cool? and Sculpture and the McDowell College. So cool. Well, I'd like to just interrupt the introduction <laughs> to show you all this very cool Lego piece that Anna made. Okay, can you shut the door on your way out? Thank you. I, I meant to mention that that could happen. Um, I have two little kids. <laughs> Um, and Molly has a studio at Stable in Washington, D.C., um, which is a very wonderful and beautiful uh, studio space and community. And they also have a gallery. And if you want, you can tell us more about that. So welcome and thank you. And um, my apologies for the interruption. Hopefully everyone got all that. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will be muting myself, but I'm happy to unmute at any point. So, um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, can you turn that on, Sarah? I should have come over here. Okay. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk to everyone about my work today. I'm going to give um, a 20 to 30 minute version of my talk and then if there's time I can go back to deleted scenes if people are interested in hearing about more projects and or I could give a, a virtual tour of my studio and, and show you um, some of the work for my current project. Um, so like Sarah mentioned, um, for the past 15 years, I've been making graphite drawings based on photocopies of printed texts. And I'm interested in the history of information and reproduction and how key moments within that history have transformed how we experience language. And these are moments like the invention of positive negative photography, or the first time somebody envisions the internet. And the projects I'm gonna to talk to you about today include an interactive archive of marginalia and uh, drawings of photocopies of books on the history of conceptual art. So with a few exceptions, everything I'll show you today are graphite on paper drawings that I've made by hand. And one way that I use drawing is to consider drawing's relationship to other media, especially photography and writing. 
Um, I think you can think of drawing as both an artistic discipline and one of the world's oldest information technologies. And written language is also an information technology. Um, in the Platonic dialogue, uh, the Phaedrus, Socrates worries about this new technology of writing. He worries that written language will make people dumber because they'll rely on written text instead of their memories. And um, in that process, maybe misunderstand an author's intent because the author isn't there to talk to. If you have a, a conversation with a book, Socrates says, it goes on telling you just the same thing forever. And as a member of the last non-digital native generation, I worry about what happens um, to our intimate relationships with written texts as their tactile material forms are increasingly eliminated. Um, I'm interested in how our image of the world changes, how inevitably uh, things are lost when new systems of information take hold. So what's the difference between seeing and reading or between writing and drawing? What's the value of making something by hand when technology makes that act unnecessary? What's an original and what's a reproduction? How does the relationship between readers and text change as we go from printed books to electronic books? And how can we use the technologies of yesterday to comprehend those of today? So I don't claim to have definitive answers to any of those questions, but those are the sort of questions and ideas that motivate me to make my work and that I hope my work will raise for viewers. Um, so I'll go back quickly to um, uh, an early moment in my own work. Uh, so I was trained as a very traditional painter at a, a tiny liberal arts school with a very small art department. Um, so when I graduated, I wasn't quite ready to go on to an MFA program. So I went to the post-baccalaureate uh, program at the Maryland Institute College of Art. And when I was there, I started making oil paintings of text-bearing objects. Things like uh, personal letters, postcards, ticket stubs, receipts. And I had a lot of ideas about the relationships between those objects and memory, about nostalgia, about the processes of collecting and cataloging. And I was really influenced by the work of 19th century American trompe painters, um, like John Pichot, whose work you see here. And trompe l'oeil is French for to fool the eye. And these kinds of paintings were very popular in 19th century America, but trompe l'oeil uh, dates back to ancient Greece. So it's a well-established tradition within the history of uh, Western uh, painting as a representational medium. And critics of trompe l'oeil might say um, that it's simply imitation, it's not really art, and it obviously involves a lot of technical skill, but I think there's a lot going on there. Um, Trompe really challenges a viewer's visual security. When it's really convincing, you doubt your ability to discern what's real and what isn't, and it forces you to take an active role in looking. Um, so I think you can make the argument that Trompe was one of our first conceptual art forms because the artists are making representational work that is about the idea of representation. And this is happening in an era when photography is coming on the scene. And so now painting comes less about illusion. So it's a very deliberate decision to try to trick a viewer through painting when illusion is no longer primary goal of the medium. Uh, but ultimately, trompe l'oeil wasn't the right medium for my ideas about objects and memory and collecting and cataloging. You know, I thought those ideas were in the work and I hoped that viewers would see that and think about those things too. But ultimately, the work's form was not a good match for its content. And I didn't really understand that until I got to graduate school at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm gonna skip a little bit. So when I was at Berkeley, I, um, I stopped trompe l'oeil painting I, um, I was still interested in these ideas of memory and objects. So my master's thesis project used a collection of notes that I'd say from high school as its source material. So these are the kind of notes that you 
pass between friends under the desk during class or in the hallways between classes. And I used those notes as source material for um, some paintings, some digital photographs, and these drawings that you see here. So uh, there was a three part project, and this third part was the, a series of drawings at each note and object that was in the collection I was using. And each drawing was a very clinical life-size rendering of the object. They were dated in time for the date and time that I finished each drawing. Um, so in this part of the project, memory was meant to be like a catalog, something that's very clear and organized, maybe the way that we would like to be able to remember things with a thing lost or omitted. And I think in a lot of ways, um, it was the most successful part of the project because it was drawing. Um, they had a, a directness and immediacy that people responded to. There was also the self-conscious act of me making the drawings in an organized way that was inherent in the work. So the relationship between the form and content was much stronger than in my earlier paintings. And something that I had come to understand during uh, my experience in grad school was that as an artist, my first responsibility is to my idea. And my job is to determine the best medium to convey my ideas. And increasingly, uh, that best medium was drawing. And one thing that helped me realize this was studying the history of conceptual art of the 1960s and 1970s. And I first read this book I'm showing you here at Berkeley as part of the late 20th century art history class. And I had never st really studied conceptual art before. And it ended up totally changing my thinking for how work can be made and what it can be made about. Um, so that's the full title of the book on the cover. Uh, it gives you a nice summary of what conceptual art is. Essentially, it privileges the idea behind the work over whatever material form the artwork takes. And conceptual art uh, doesn't even necessarily take permanent physical form. You know, often the only evidence that it existed is some kind of documentation, like a written statement or a photograph. Um, and this includes earth art, like people like Robert Smithson, um, who you may have come across in an art history class, or, or performance art, people like Chris Burden or, or Bruce Nauman. Um, all of that would be kind of under the umbrella of conceptual art. Um, and so studying this, learning about it, totally shifted my frame of reference from the history of Western painting and drawing to the history of conceptual art. And it really forced me to think about the relationship between uh, text and image and to focus more on process and concept rather than seeing my work in terms of a um, specific disciplinary tradition. So shortly after graduate school in 2005, I started making drawings and photocopies of books. And so I had spent grad school really closely looking at the physical reality of words on paper. Um, and both during and right after grad school, I was often in the library making photocopies, whether it was for my own research or finding readings for the classes I was teaching. And I'd really been forced to ask myself in grad school, what was I doing? Well, I was reproducing objects, specifically text, and I was doing it mainly by drawing. So my next question was, well, what does it mean to reproduce something? So um, I usually approach things at first very literally. Um, so that's what I did. I started making these drawings of photocopies of books. Um, so this is a drawing of a page from Lucy Lepard's Six Years, that book I just showed you, that history of conceptual art. Um, and I, I liked the idea that by using a photocopy, I was using a tool that played a large part in the history of conceptual art. Um, conceptual artists often use the Xerox machine photocopies to disseminate their work. Um, but at the same time, I was kind of rematerializing the things that conceptual artists sought to dematerialize. So I was trying to bridge this gap between uh, the traditional history of representation and more idea-based art.
Um, so I, like I said at the beginning, I'm interested in making work that explores these moments of uh, transformation. And I consider the late 1960s and 1970s when conceptual art, especially text-based conceptual art, explodes as one of those moments, at least within the history of art. So I made um, a series of drawings exclusively based on photocopies of books about conceptual art. And the show was designed to look like a deconstructed book. So there's a cover, a page, a table of contents, an introduction, an index, a back cover, but it's actually a composite of, of several books. Um, and so sh showing you these drawings is also a way of me sneaking in um, a little bit more conceptual art to show you. Um, this is Solowitz's uh, sentences on conceptual art. Uh, the last sentence of which uh, says, these sentences comment on art, but are not art. So on one hand, these drawings are an homage to work that was really influential on me uh, as a young artist. But um, there's also a tension between that work, which was about uh, de-emphasizing material qualities and the way my drawings are made, very much by hand, very much about the material of the graphite and the paper. Um, so this drawing is a statement by Douglas Schufler. Uh, it's a famous statement, the world is full of objects more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more, um, is how that begins. Um, so here I am adding art, art objects to the world and making art objects out of things that were never intended to be art objects. You know, I think sometimes conceptual art gets a bad rap for taking itself too seriously or being too kind of um, cynical or or academic um, but it has a lot of heart it has a lot of humor uh, that might be kind of dry humor but they are meant to be kind of poking fun at the art world um, this piece general strike piece is by Lee Lozano um, where she declares she's going on strike from the art world right it's just a simple uh, graphite on her statement is graphite on paper I've photocopied it, redrawn it, graphite on paper. Um, so there are a lot of aesthetic, aesthetic decisions being made by the artist. Lee Lozano chose to write her statement by hand on a piece of graph paper, right? That's an aesthetic decision. Um, and you know, despite conceptual artist's best efforts, it can't, escape, uh, it can't completely escape material form, right? It got documented through photography or text and reproduced in books. And those books have material qualities. And I try to amplify those material properties by turning the books into photocopies and then the photocopies into drawings. Um, and this drawing, um, a translation, um, is also from the book Six Years. And on the right hand, you see uh, an image of Vito Acanchi's performance piece, following piece. Um, but the title of this drawing comes from a statement by Lawrence Weiner, um, a translation from one language to another, which is on the opposite page, which you probably can't see too clearly in the, the image there. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Okay, so the, the last second project I'm gonna to talk to you about um, is an ongoing project that I've been working on since 2007, the Marginalia Archive. And in 2007, I started writing to friends, and family, colleagues, asking them to send me uh, photocopies of books or other texts that they had annotated. So, you know, when you read, you might sometimes leave marks on the page as you're reading it, um, whether you're underlining it or writing notes in the margin. And the fancy word for that is marginalia. And it's um, a physical manifestation of our um, relationship with a book as we're reading it. And I'm really interested in that because um, that relationship is something I feel is rapidly changing as more and more of the information we consume is done through a digital format. So a lot of the 
uh, books and text I've worked from already had marginalia, um, books that I drew for other projects, for those um, conceptual art book project as well. Um, so it wasn't a huge leap to start thinking about marginalia specifically. And at first I thought the submissions would serve as source material for drawings or maybe work in other media. But as I got more and more submissions, I started to see them as, as work in their own right and not just source material. So I decided I would organize the submissions into a functioning archive that viewers could access and contribute to um, during the course of an exhibition. So when the project is installed in a gallery, um, the binders are available for viewers to look through. And I usually um, uh, put a selection of marginalia up on the walls for people to look at it on the wall in that format. And then there's also a photocopier in the gallery uh, with instructions on how viewers can participate if they want to contribute marginalia to the archive. And then there's a, a usually a table with an inbox um, for people to leave their um, submissions in, for them to sit down and fill out their submission, flip through binders. Um, you know, I think of archives and libraries as being these amazing physical spaces where the physical material relationship um, to books is preserved. Um, and this version of the project was at Flashpoint Gallery. It was a, a space here in DC. It's, it was right across the street from the main branch of the DC Public Library. And it was important to me to show the project there. Um, and over the course of the year leading up to the show, I searched the public library's collection for books with marginalia and I added um, selections from them to the archive. Uh, there's another installation shot, a different version. It kind of changes a little bit each time it gets installed in a different space. Um, and this was the last um, installation um, this past winter at my alma mater, uh, Queens. It's now Queens University. When I was there, it was Queens College um, in Charlotte. And um, it was really nice to show the project there and have the students and faculty submit and I got a, a ton of submissions um, and up until when the university had to shut down for um, the pandemic. Um, so this is an installation shot um, from that iteration. Um, so I'll backtrack a little bit about the process of the archive. Um, so along with the photocopy, I asked people to fill out a form that asked for basic bibliographic information on why they selected that text. And I used that information to generate the classification number for this submission. Um, and that classification number is based on a real classification system that was part of another project I did that I don't have time to talk to you about today. Um, but in any case, that, um, the forms get uh, filed into the binders along with the photocopies, given the classification number. And the submission gets entered into a hand-drawn ledger and then filed into those binders based on category. And those are things like academic, personal, professional, um, those kinds of things. And once I had that critical mass of submissions and I started to think about how I wanted to visualize what was going on in the archive with drawings. So I, like I usually do, I started out pretty uh, straightforward and literally um, by drawing um, this triptych of the letter I sent to people and a corresponding uh, form and photocopy. Um, and part of the idea was that uh, the drawing of the letter would serve as both a drawing and as explanatory wall text that would explain to viewers what steps they needed to take to participate. And that's something I do a lot with text in my work. Um, there's often a drawing in a project that is a drawing, but also doubles as the wall text that you might see you know, at the be beginning of an exhibition um, to kind of tell people about itself. And here are some details of those first archive drawings.
And as things evolved, uh, I started selecting marginalia from the archive and playing around with blowing it up on the photocopier until it became more removed from the original source. So the, the printed text in this drawing is from the poem Sleeping on the Wing by Frank O'Hara. And the marginalia is by the poet Bill Bergson. So here's Bill's submission. As you can see his form and his photocopy. And then here's a, a detail from the drawing. Um, so I like working with limitations, right? A, a photocopier offers a lot of parameters. You know, you can only enlarge 400% at any given time. You can only adjust uh, the image or toner quality so much. Um, you can only use certain kinds of paper. Um, and when you start enlarging and then re-enlarging the enlargement, the integrity of the image really starts to break down. So you get uh, a lot of details get lost, imperfections become amplified, and you get holes that start to show up in letter forms that you didn't see in the original. And part of the idea is that I hope that breakdown uh, visualizes and parallels what's happening to language today um, as it evolves from printed physical text to digital. And you might uh, recognize this space, uh, the Cody Gallery there at Marymount. Um, the project uh, that I showed here uh, was an extension of the Marginalia Archive. The source material for this series of drawings came from the found Marginalia that I found in the DC Public Library. And it focused on um, the underlining of sentences. Um, so the drawings follow the rise and fall of a reader's hand or an underline as it moves from panel to panel beneath the sentence. So the two you see here um, are part of a, a nine, um, nine drawings as part of the series that um, follow that um, length of an underlined sentence on a page. I'll show you some more. So here's a detail. Um, and part of the idea is that emphasizing the underline is meant to confuse this relationship between um, writing and drawing and reading and seeing. So hopefully um, following the underlying um, kind of moves of your back and forth between the reading of the fragments you, you can see in the drawing and the seeing the line, seeing the word forms as part of, of the visual aspect of the drawing. You know, I think, you know, a line is fundamental to drawing and writing. You don't have an image or you don't have written language without it. And I've come to think of my more recent drawings as pieces of writing that are experienced visually, but, you know, they could be read as a document or a poem. So uh, the drawings function on one level as a kind of poetry. And, um, you know, I think, again, this underline, the use of the underline emphasizes the materiality of text and our physical relationship to it, which is central to the archive and basically everything I do. Um, and while I think of things as my drawings as being pieces of writing, if what I wanted to say uh, could be said in writing alone, I'd be a writer and not an artist. So I do hope that there's something kind of more indescribable about the experience of reading and seeing the drawings. Okay, I will stop there. <laughs> That's the short version. So if folks have um, questions, um, I'm happy to take them. I can also give the virtual studio tour. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen right now just so I can see people properly, but I can go back and show other images if needed.
That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly. And yeah. I, I have a couple questions, but I want to open it up to you guys first um, to see what kind of questions you ask. Um, so, so go ahead. If anybody has questions, you can just feel free to, to unmute and ask. If you feel more comfortable typing it in the chat, you can, of course, but um, I'd love it if you just, just unmuted and asked whatever you're curious about. And if no one has questions, I'll ask mine. But. Hello, artist Molly. Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. They are amazing. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I have no background about uh, artists and drawing. The last class I have taken was in the second grade. And my question is, uh, why most of the artists leaning toward using pencil, charcoal, or um, uh, graphite when they're drawing instead of using uh, warm colors like red or orange or? Well, I can speak for myself about that. I think, you know, there are a lot of contemporary artists who, uh, whose practice is mainly drawing that use color, colored pencils, oil pastels, watercolor, like a huge amount of drawing being done today that's done in color. And I encourage my own students to experiment with that. Um, for myself, um, I, you know, if, Answer A to that is kind of a lame answer because everyone has um, affinities for things, right? You don't necessarily know why. Um, and I've always had an affinity for graphite. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but you know, you have things you like and you just like them. And so that's one reason why I use graphite. Another reason is that, um, you know, I mentioned that I like um, parameters. And a, a pencil is a, a deceptively simple tool, right? You, you write, you know, you fill a, out a standardized test with it. You jot down a quick note. Um, but graphite is a really um, a broad medium. You can make it look like all kinds of different surfaces. It can be really rough. It could be really smooth. Um, you get a wide range of value out of it. So it could be really light. It could be really, really dark. Um, but at, this, at the core, it's just some dirt in, encased in wood, right? So it's this like very simple piece of technology, but using that technology you can get a wide range of um, results. Um, so that's another reason why I like graphite because I don't like having a lot of options. I like narrowing my um, focus and seeing what I can do within it. Also, um, because I am interested in language and information technologies, um, the um, kind of relationship between writing and drawing, I, in my mind, is kind of best expressed through the graphite pencil. It's a writing tool. It's also a drawing tool. Um, I hope, I hope so that answers. Yeah, yeah. And also it's much easier to uh, draw in a pencil and much control with the pencil too. Yes, if you, if, I'm also a kind of person who doesn't like to get messy. <laughs> you, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier to control the mess with a pencil for sure. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was really interesting to hear about the reason for the pencil too. Thanks for that question, Abdullah. Does anyone else have a question for Molly? Go ahead. Hi, Lydia. Yeah, sort of piggybacking off of that, as someone who also ha has an affinity towards pencils and gra graphite, that's what I'm most comfortable with, how do you get your blending and your texture so smooth? Because that's been something I've been having trouble with personally. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a mix of a, a few things. So one is the paper. So I use um, Reeves BFK paper. It's, um, it's got a little bit of tooth, but it's not um, really rough. It's kind of, it's really more like a printmaking paper. So the surface um, is smooth enough that you can avoid having like a lot of uh, uh, like dusty parts that come up when you're putting down the graphite. Um, and it's also just a matter of just working really slowly and methodically, building up 
layers um, over periods of time. Um, I have my cart here. So I also um, make a lot of use out of uh, blending sticks, <laughs> these guys. Um, you know, it's like this compressed cotton that makes these blending sticks. You can see they get really dirty. So when they get this dirty, you can just draw directly with them too, which is really nice. Um, I make use of, um, of these kind of styrofoam brushes to build up larger areas of, um, of value when there's a big background and to fill in. I'll like, go in with a graphite stick and then I'll blend it, and then I'll go back in, and I'll blend it. Um, but graphite is kind of tricky in that way. You have to, it takes time. It's not like charcoal where you can work pretty quickly to build up value. You have to, with graphite, you have to take your time, go slowly, um, and be patient with it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, what do you look for when you pick the, um, when people put in their, uh, when they're, um, what's the word? The um, marginalia, yeah. Yes, but when you are making notes um, and reading and stuff, when they go into the exhibition and they're doing that, um, what are you looking for when you choose those ones that you um, put in your show what are you looking for what is there like a handwriting or um are you like imagining the person that was doing it or um is there just something that you look for or that you like um to display when i select the submissions that go up on the wall in an installation i usually look for a kind of range of um, subjects and people so like a lot of like one question on the form is you can say what your occupation is so because i know a lot of artists there's a lot of artists in the archive but they're also um you know people who are psychologists people who are um, um stay-at-home moms like people who have different backgrounds and so they have different kinds of subject matter that they select to put into the archive so um when i Put the select make the selection of submissions that go up on the wall. I try to look for a range of um, of the different kinds of literature, of the different like reasons and backgrounds of the people. So it's just not all like artists and art books, right? Like um, people, you know, there's music in the archive because people um, annotate their sheet music. There's uh, recipes um, because people annotate their cookbooks. Like my aunt has given me several like really cool old cookbook recipes that she's made notes in. Um, so there's all kinds of um, subject matter. Um, there's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's really academic stuff. There's like Vogue magazines. There's all, like I try to be really um, democratic about the stuff that comes into the archive because I wouldn't want it to be like only art stuff or only art history stuff. There's a lot of that, but um, there's all kinds of other things too. Um, but when I go to make drawings from it, um, it really varies. Um, you know, that, that series I showed you at the end, I had the idea to like look for underlines. And so I went through the archive looking for um, various <laughs> forms of underlining. You know, some people are really violent about it. Some people are really light about it. Some people like use a ruler to make it straight. You know, there are all kinds of different kinds of ways that people mark books. So um, some of the, sometimes I'll look at that and I'll say, like, okay, well, what kind of asterisks are in the archive? And look through to see like what kind of stars people make, what kind of check marks, um, that kind of thing. So sometimes that'll inform how I make the, how I make selections for the drawings. Um, I also had a question. Um, I was, I was wondering, because you said earlier when you were mentioning um, your conceptual work, like how you got into it, you said it was very immediate um, in its visual impact. And I was wondering if you could speak more to that because uh, um, I was watching this Basquiat documentary and uh, in his early work, uh, some art critics, they say like the same thing about how his, his work had like an immediate impact on the viewer. 
And I think, um, and it, I don't think it's artists as conceptual as uh, yours, but I was one, curious to know more about that immediate impact that you feel your um, your art has. Um, I think I've said that in relationship to the note drawings that I had made and how um, they felt a little more um, successful than some of the other parts of my work because they felt more immediate for the viewer. So um, there wasn't a lot of, I think one thing about drawing is that you hear this word a lot, immediacy about drawing. And what does that really mean? I think it means that there aren't a lot of steps between you and the finished work, right? You take your pencil, you take, you know, your Sharpie, your oil stick, whatever it is you're making the drawing with, and you just start making work on the page. So there's not a, there are not multiple steps, right? You're not putting down a ground um, and building it up the way you have to do in a, a painting. You're not carving a, a plate and running through the press multiple times the way you have to do in printmaking. Um, so there's this one-to-one um, -one relationship between your eye, hand, and the, and the surface that it's going on. And I think that's um, something I realized about drawing um, when I was working through all of my artist um, issues that you work through when you're in grad school. Um, and so I, I realized that I didn't have to make paintings to be an artist. I can make drawings. Um, and I will say though that now that, um, especially when I was making my, my early photocopy drawings, you know, I talked about Trump Loy and how um, I was influenced by Trump Loy. And my early photocopy drawings are at um, one level Trump Loy objects because they look like photocopies and people often mistook them, still mistake my work for being just photocopies. So that immediacy that um, those note drawings had maybe isn't quite in this <laughs> work that I do now because people often just kind of think they're prints or photocopies and not, not drawings. So one thing that I try to have happen, um, especially when work is installed, is um, once people realize that things are drawing, um, they'll maybe slow down a little bit and read, uh, look, and maybe some of that immediacy will come back um, through that slower experience. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, in a sense, because I was m mostly referring to like, the impact it has on uh, the viewer. Because when I was looking at, when you showed the slide of the underline, and I was kind of looking at how you shifted the pieces so it kind of didn't flow all the way straight through. Oh, yeah. And it was kind of, when you said it was poetry, I found that like very interesting because all the elements combined of it being a photocopy, um, it also being conceptual art, it like, it just hit me at so many levels. And it was like, it, it was it was like like you said it was immediate so I kind of I really found like how you put a photocopy and it's not even a photocopy it's a drawing and then you combined it with um, uh, the marginalia I think that's what it's called and I, I really found that like to be like I, I kind of like encapsulated like the epitome of like what you were I don't know what exactly your commentary is oh uh, in your art pieces, but I, I feel like that hit me the most when you put the underlying pieces, the photocopy. I feel like that was like, that was really genius when you did that. But it does, it yeah. like, but that combined with your answer, it, it does answer my question, thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, reminding me about that, um, those underlying drawings, um, the panels are um, registered to the underline, not to the text, right? So they are at different levels as you go across. So that's another part of my strategy for disrupting the reading of the text is to have the text be um, out of line and then the underline be the thing that is um, registered from panel to panel. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, hi, um, I just had a quick question kind of adding to his kind of question to his question previously, but with the underlying work, um, 
as I looked at it, it was interesting how, I think you've done it in other works, but one code gallery too, like how you repeated some of the words. Would that just, is, is that just purely because of the underline that you repeated the words or was it because you wanted to kind of, I guess, add something, another layer to the work that you do? Yeah, it's both. Um, so a lot of my um, marginalia archive drawings will are multi-paneled and they repeat things. So if you were trying, if you were actually reading them as a document, um, you would kind of stutter <laughs> or like make weird uh, word like sounds that don't really form real words but kind of almost do. And so the repetition is kind of meant to. Um, have that happen in the drawing to kind of form new words, new phrases from panel to panel. Um, and it's also kind of something that happens in the photocopying process. So um, I make a lot of photocopies when I'm planning a drawing. And then I think of the photocopying process as being the writing process where I write the drawing. And I, I go to the copy shop and make a bunch of copies. I take them back to the studio put them out on the floor and I start putting things next to each other to see how it works. Um, and, and so that's my kind of writing process and that's how you get the, the repetitions, the, the stutters. <laughs> I like to think of them as stuttering sometimes. Um, and then I, I did wanna kind of emphasize those underlines. So sometimes um, when things re repeat, it's to get like a little longer underline. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I had a quick question about your notes project. I was on the website and it said that um, like handwritten notes were like your source material. Did you have like people give you handwritten notes or like how did you like? Yeah, so, um, so those are things that I saved from high school. So I don't know if, um, I'm now so old that you guys didn't do this in high school because you had phones and whatnot. But um, so, you know, I didn't have phones. We didn't have ways to digitally communicate. So um, we'd write written notes to each other. So you're sitting in class, you're trying to talk about something that the teacher doesn't want you to talk about. You write a note, you pass it, right? You do it in, in class in the hallway. So those high school notes that were from the note collection are those things, things that I saved, you know, between me and my good friends. Um, so that's where those come from. And yes, they're all handwritten on, you know, line to notebook paper for the most part. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope people still do that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I definitely <laughs> did it in high school and I had the immediate reference. I have, we, we would have these different ways that, that you would fold them, um, you know, how yeah, small you have to and little really tiny, tiny yeah, like little mini sculpture, drawing sculptures. But I don't think I don't. I have not seen seen them around. I don't know. I would imagine that that nobody here has actually done that. But I, I got the reference. Does anybody else have any other questions? It's been great to hear the questions that you guys have. And yeah, these are great questions. In middle school, someone said in middle school. <laughs> yeah. I one of the things that we'll see if I can get my my question in. Hold hold on. Okay, <laughs> we'll see. I might have five more minutes. Um, one of the things that I was curious about, and I don't know if you can if you can talk about this without showing us images of your process, but is is about the the process. And it was great seeing the objects that you use and and the questions about how you get to the end result because it's so seamless and the illusion is definitely there and it's interesting to think about the sense of immediacy and the sense of process and how it is in a sense you the viewer can kind of see it but then i think about all the steps and how long it must take for you to make one drawing so i'm just curious if you could talk very briefly about your process and maybe the time i know sometimes it's hard to know exactly how long something makes because you're just making it um, mm -hmm. But maybe just give give students a sense of that. And then I also wanted to respond to the scale. Um, one of the things that I also respond to about the last, the Cody Gallery installation is scale and, and how you 
installed the pieces and I feel like that the body starts to get involved and, and people like there's this different accessibility to that. Um, so, and then thinking about your earlier works where they were smaller and then what you were doing and the jump in scale and some of our classes were also talking about the jump in scale, whereas you're seeing the whole note or you're zooming in. Um, so anything you'd like to talk about about process and scale and and how you install the work and intend the viewer to connect to the work. Sure. So, so like I was just saying, I, I start by, you know, I select a, whatever text I'm going to work with and I um, make a lot of photocopies. And then it's kind of an editing writing process and filtering through the copies um, and deciding which ones I'm going to actually draw. And then um, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have an in progress drawing in the studio right now. I just finished um, some things, so everything is finished. <laughs> so I can't, I don't have anything to show you that's in between, but everything is one-to-one. -one. So even when a drawing is like 34 by 22 inches, um, there was a 34 by 22 photocopy that I used as a template. So I do what I can do on the standard photocopier, and then I use a, a blueprint enlarger to make a copy of that final copy and blow it up to the size that I need. And then um, I use a sheet of um, graphite transfer paper to get a ghost image of the text, any like major detail that I want to be sure is where it needs to be. And then I go back in and I, um, complete the drawing by looking at the photocopy. Sometimes I look at the, the giant photocopy. Sometimes I look at the final, like 11 by 17 or eight and a half by 11. Sometimes I kind of split the difference depending on what details transferred from copy to copy. Um, I, here, I'll get up and walk around a little bit just so you can see scale. Um, so when I first started making photocopy drawings, they were eight and a half by 11 or 11 by 17. And then I started enlarging. Um, for a lot of reasons, I was getting bored of the small um, format. Um, I wanted there to be, and especially in the marginalia archive, since everything in the archive is eight and a half by 11, it didn't make sense to have the drawings be the same size. There had to be some kind of translation happening from the archive to the um to the drawings on the wall um so these are um i just finished this five panel drawing last week um so i'll hold my so there's like my hand next to the text to kind of give you some scale um these drawings are um, part of my most recent project which um uses a a holograph draft of virginia wolf's novel to the lighthouse as its main source material. Um, I haven't yet <laughs> worked that into my talk yet, so I didn't <laughs> talk about that, but that gives you like a sense of kind of larger scale in space. Um, again, like I like multi-panel formats because text can um, kind of be read from panel to panel. Uh, and this project also uses uh, non text-based source material. So these kind of abstract drawings that you saw behind me um, are based on collages that I made from photocopies of Virginia Woolf's uh, photo albums. Um, so there's kind of non-text-based imagery that's part of the project. Um, here's a kind of portrait of Virginia Woolf. Um, also based on photographs from her album. I can show you all around the, the back side of my studio. I have a weird shaped studio. There's a couple more of those. I'm getting a little better at doing the digital virtual tour. <laughs> um, I can show you my, just to give you a sense of like the range of materials, which again are pretty simple. So here's my little drawing part with my various um, grades of 2H, H, B, 2B, 4B jars. Um, 
So it's, you know, material wise, it's a pretty simple, straightforward process. I don't, you know, use a lot of fancy stuff. It's really just the paper and the pencil. That's great. It's really nice to, I love seeing the work, the work, uh, the materials, just the table, the tape that's hanging down, you know, your graphite sheets. I think it's, it's nice. I try to save tape. It's kind of stupid, but <laughs> every little bit time. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's nice to, to hear about the graphite transfer too. Um, you know, I, some of these students are, you know, drawing from observation and, and not really doing things like that right now. And some of the students are specifically, we've, we've done the transfer so that they're not really focusing on how to draw the image as accurately, but more about the technique and, and some other elements like in 2D design. And I think that, you know, going forward in your artistic careers for the students to hear, um, there are a lot of different processes, you know, observational drawing for those of you that are in the, the observational drawing classes, you know, you want to work on those skills as best you can. But later on, you know, you can use multiple methods to kind of obtain your final results. So it's nice to, to hear that because they are so exact and that it's important for you that they are exact. There's less, you want less variability where you're looking at something and interpreting it um, visually and kind of trying to convey it in a, maybe a different way. Your goal is to have them really be literally almost as the same thing but in a different medium. So. Uh, you know, even though I do want them to be as close as possible, right? I'm not a robot. You know, if you, it's hard to tell and when you're looking at things through a screen and digitally, but um, when you're able to see them in person, like the drawing I'm looking at right now, I see all the mistakes, right? But the letter forms are not perfect. They're, they're a little wobbly. They're, um, you know, the serifs are fatter in other letters than they should be, right? So it's still, um, you know, I still use my hand to do all of that transferring, like. Um, you know, a lot of times I have students think, well, isn't it cheating to use some kind of transfer method? No, it's not because you're still doing it with your hand. You're still using your eye to do the transferring. You're still, your brain is still sending those messages from your eye to your hand. And, um, you know, one person's uh, graphite transfer method or uh, projector transfer um, it's not gonna be as good as another person's, right? It still takes skill, it still takes thought and planning to do it. It's, it's just another tool in your arsenal as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been wonderful. I really enjoy, and the students have really enjoyed hearing about your process. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. It's fun to always, it's always fun to talk about the work. <laughs> It's, it's great. It's, it's perfect in so many ways for all the students and what they're doing in the work too. So thank you so much for taking the time and um, yeah, talking to us. Thank you. Stay right. well. Be, be safe. Okay. Thank you. Have good Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanksgiving.